And we're going to talk about the love of God, the love of God. We've been singing about it all morning. And uh, love is, a, in the words of Huey Lewis, it's a curious thing, isn't it? Make a one man weep, make another man sang. You know that one? That's the power of love. Bow, bow. It's a good tune. Go check it out. It's your 80s content for the day. It is. It's tricky. Love, love is not easy to describe. When, you, when you're in love and, you, and someone asks you, how do you know? You say, what? I just know, right? It's confusing. Some of us have thought we were in love and we, turns out, weren't. Yeah? Anybody dodge a bullet? Or 10? <laughs> yeah. We, we know love is tricky. It's confusing. And it takes time to learn how to love. Love is not just a feeling. It's more than a feeling. Right? We, another 80s song. We've learned that. Those of us who've been married for a while, you know that love is multifaceted. And it's tricky. And it takes time to get to know one another. And love has to grow as intimacy and trust and knowledge grows. Sometimes when you first start out in a relationship, for instance, you don't even know what the other person's love language is. And it can get kind of, you can get the wires crossed. I remember, uh, we, like I said a few weeks ago, my wife and I celebrated our 13th wedding anniversary, and I'm just so, like, I'm so in love with her, legitimately, and I'm not even saying that to, like, score some points. It's Father's Day. She has to be good to me, <laughs> right? Like, get that Father's Day action. Anyway, I didn't say that in church, did I? No. Anyway, um, I'm so in love with her, though. Like, the depth of my relationship with her in 13 years has only grown as we've learned each other, and we, we, we know each other better, and now I know how she thinks, and she knows how I think. Sometimes we even finish each other's sandwiches. <laughs> that's what I was going to say, right? Anybody frozen? Anybody? Yeah, like, but that's taken time. I was, I was thinking back, like, how far we've come in our relationship as it's grown, as I've learned her love and she's learned mine and we've surrendered and trusted each other. I can actually remember the day, it was a summer, uh, it was uh, in, in July and it was back in 2005 when I'd finally made up the decision that I'm going to marry this girl and uh, I was at Beulah camp and my, my, my then girlfriend Melanie was there and my cousin and I decided, uh, I, I came up with this big story to t tell my wife here, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to be at this thing and don't worry about it, I'll be back in a little bit. And we went into St. John and I went to uh, Charm Diamond Center and I bought, the, I bought her ring and, uh, and it was just this big thing that I did and it was behind the scenes and I got back and, and she wasn't like happy about the fact that I just disappeared for six hours. And like she it was one of our most epic fights actually. Like she just blew off the handle and she was there with my family and my, I remember my mom saying, give it to him, Mel. And then like... like and here I am doing this thing, like thinking this is the most romantic, loving thing I've ever done. And she's blowing up on me. And we got in this huge fight. And I had to basically let the cat out of the bag. Like, woman, I was buying your engagement ring. Back it up. Right? Like, <laughs> so the surprise kind of wasn't there. But like, I was just thinking about like how our, our love has grown. Like, I learned that lying to her wasn't a good thing um, and, and figuring out other ways to show my love. And, and it's been something that has to be developed. And that's the tricky thing about love, isn't it? It's this thing that we have to kind of work away at. It's not just a feeling. It's not just a sensation. But there's this ongoing thing to, to, to actually experience love. And it's tricky. And if you think it's tricky with your relationships with, with mortal, limited human beings, how much more difficult could it be maybe to understand the love of an infinite, all-knowing, all-sufficient, everlasting, all-glorious God? And yet today, that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to look at the love of God. And, and we're going to find that probably for a lot of us, our understanding of the love of God sometimes is superficial, as superficial as my love for my wife was early. It was genuine, but it was shallow. And we have to learn one another to go deeper in love. And we're going to find today, though, that, that the love of God is actually the key to living the life of God. That learning His love and learning to love Him is the key that brings the fruitfulness in your life with Him. And so if you have a Bible, uh, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're just going to kind of do the deep dive uh, Bible study. Uh, there's some people, if you want a Bible, just slip your hand up. We'll get that to you, all of our locations. We'll, uh, we'll give it a Bible in your hand. Why don't you follow along? We're just going to... 
park in one passage of scripture today, and we're going to kind of do the deep dive as we continue our series we're calling Know God. If you're just joining us, we have been in a series for the last few weeks now. Uh, it's a theology series, and it's a teaching series, and we're, we're diving a little deeper than we normally do, aren't we? We're, we're kind of doing the work. This is a little more la- like labor-intensive. It's a little more work for you. It's not as many cute stories and a little more big words, right? But it's going to be helpful and healthy for us, and we're finding out that some of our knowledge of God is, is fairly superficial and, in some cases, incorrect. Sometimes it's a no God. We've learned that just because we feel something doesn't mean that that's God. God is not our feelings. God is not our fears. Sometimes our friends have influenced us in a way that, that we've con- conceived of a God that's no God. And then last, last week, we talked about the power of God. And didn't Pastor Seth do such an incredible job? If you missed that message, please go back and watch it. It is like in our DNA here about being a church that knows the power of God, the mega and moving and measured power of God. And what I want to do today is actually for our series, I want to talk about the love of God. I'm just going to pick up where we left off last week in Ephesians chapter 3, where Seth started the groundwork. And we're going to take it a little farther. And we're going to look at what Paul is saying. You have, you ready? You with me? Okay, West Halifax. Okay, let's dive in and let's just see what the love of God is all about, what it does in your life, and how we are supposed to figure out how to love Him back. Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Now, actually, let me just give you a little context before I read it. Ephesians was a real church in a real place at a real time, and Paul is writing them a letter from prison, instructing them on this new life they've received in Christ. He's talking about the inheritance they receive as, as believers that, that we have, he said earlier, have been seated with Christ in heavenly places, that we are a new creation in him. It's this explosive, amazing grace story, and he said we've been made, made alive in Jesus, and so he gets to verse 14, and he says, here's my prayer for you. Here's my prayer for you. He says in verse 14, follow along. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through, through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your, say it out loud, in your hearts, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Get that picture in your mind, that, that inner feeling through faith. And I pray that you being rooted, or another translation says grounded, so under your feet, that you being rooted or grounded and established in love, so so not only love in your heart, but love standing in it, love in in your life, that you may have power together with all the saints to grasp or to know how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Again, there's that trickiness of love, isn't it? How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? How do you know love? I just, I just know, yeah. That you, here, here's the reason. So he says these prayers. I want these things to kind of lock in, that you, 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 feel, you, you accept the love of Christ in your heart, that you're rooted and grounded in your, in your, in your life, that, that you know, that you understand the, the scope of his love, and here's why. Now watch this. This is one of the most incredible promises of the Scripture. Look what he says. So that you may be, say it, filled. Not like just deposited, but filled to the full measure, to the full measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. Think about that for a second. Paul says, I'm praying that these three things happen so that the the byproduct, the fruitfulness of those three things locking into place, when you learn to love God with your with your with your with your heart, when you when you get grounded in it, when you when you conceive of it, then when what happens is the love of God invades your life and you will be filled to the fullness of the you will be filled to the full measure of the fullness of God. Like, think about that. Like, what, what, what do we know based on what we've been talking about the last few weeks, some of the, some of the attributes of God? We talked about God's holiness, that, that he's all-powerful, that he's all-glorious, that he's all-mighty, that he's all-knowing. Paul is saying, you'll be filled to the full measure of the wisdom of God, the life of God, the power of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, the hope of God, the, the brilliance of God, the purpose of God, the meaning of God, all that stuff that you and I long for, and we look all over the earth and in every other relationship for Paul is saying, my prayer for you is that you align your life in such a way that you are filled to the full measure of all the fullness of God. Whew. Can you imagine like just what it would be like to live your life full of peace, regardless of the circumstance, 
full of hope, regardless of the circumstance, full of self-control, regardless of the circumstance, full of life and joy and provision. All of the stuff of God, Paul is saying, this is not getting the valleys excited enough, hopefully West and Halifax, all of the stuff of God, he's saying is yours in Christ. Wow, full of it. And he gives us the key though, on how to actually access it. And we're just gonna, we're gonna go back, we're gonna do the deep dive in here. And he shows us the way in which we align our lives in order to receive all the fullness of the life of God. Did you catch it? He said there are three main things. Let's, let's, let me get my art on here today. I'm gonna, I taught Jeremy Lamus everything he knows. I'm gonna do a self-portrait here. A little balding in the back, a little, Creeping, creeping in the front a little bit. So Paul says, isn't that nice? It's good. It's supposed to be for sale after church, all right? Um, Paul says that, that basically I want you to feel the full scope of God's life. I want you to, to experience the full scope of God's life. And he actually lays out what that true life is going to look like. And, and he gives us kind of a secret into how we as human beings experience life and love. We actually experience it in three ways. He, he, he said, first and foremost, he said, I want you to uh, know the love of Christ in what? Your inner being, in your heart. So in your heart. He said, I want you to know the, the love of God in your heart, in your inner being. So what he's, what's he talking about? He's talking about feelings. He's talking about emotions. He's talking about that, that feeling that you get. It's the passion. Y'all y'all know when you first, those of you who are married, you, you had it when you first kind of met, the butterflies, that, that heart passion, that heart affection. He's saying, I want you to know the love of Christ in your heart. I want you to experience it. And it, that, that you need to, if you're going to know the love and life of God, it's going to first and foremost going to have to be in your heart. It's a feeling, okay? But he goes further and he says, I also want you to be grounded in it. So he, he talks about like the body. This is rooted and established, didn't he? He said grounded in it. So what's he talking about? He's talking about your lifestyle, isn't he? He's talking about your doing. In your being, in your actions. How many of you know, I mean, those of you who've been married, you realize, and, and the, the song is right, love is more than a feeling, isn't it? Love is more than a feeling. Love is just more than having the butterflies. And we need to recapture this for the world. The church needs to, to lead out in this to show that marriage is much more, that true love is much more than just feeling. It's commitment, isn't it? It's about commitment. It's about a vow. It's about a lifestyle. It's about, hey, we're in this together through thick and thin, hell or high water. That's what real love is, isn't it? And Paul is saying that if you're going to live in the love of Christ, if you're going to live in the love of God, and you're going to receive the fruit of that relationship, all the fullness thereof, he says you're going to have to feel you're going to have to have the love of God in your heart. You're going to have to have the love of God in your life, in your actions, in your activities. This is about obedience. It's about trust. And then he says what? And he says I pray that you grasp. So he's talking about the love of God in your mind. He's talking about your intellect. Your thinking. So he's saying the love of God has to invade. If you're, going to, if you're going to have a relationship with God and you're going to experience all the fullness of God and you're going to get that, that joy and that peace, it's going to have to invade your, in your whole life. That love is more than just your doing. Love is more than just your feeling. And love is more than just your thinking. But all three of these things make the full measure. And we, we know this in our actual relationships, don't we? That this, we've seen this in our actual, actual relationships. Maybe, you've, maybe those of you who are dating right now, you've had, you've had relationships where, you know what, the heart was in it, but you realize we're incompatible, that we don't have the same values, that he thinks about the world differently than I do, and that he, he does different things that I don't do, or, or maybe you, you, don't, you don't connect intellectually, maybe you aren't on the same wavelength. We've seen that, we've seen that happen, haven't we, in our, in our actual relationships? This also happens in our relationships with God. You, we all have a, a tendency to call loving God really just one of these things or two of these things. And where dysfunction creeps in is when one of these things isn't being stewarded. So, so for instance, some of you might have grown up in a church tradition where they were heavy on obedience and action. That the, the measure of loving God is really on how good you can be. But really, 
loving God in just, with just your action, that, what's that? We call that legalism. With no heart and no mind, that's just legalism. It's blind obedience. That's not, that God's, the Bible's saying that's not true love. True love looks like doing the right thing for the, with the right heart and the right reasons. Yeah? That's really good, just so you know. Like, that's... <laughs> Or we've, we've, we've seen people, maybe you've encountered somebody who can quote the, the, the whole Pentateuch. They're like, they're like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, and they got it in the Hebrew. <laughs> and yet you're like, do you even know God? Do you, have you ever even like cried? Has the love of God ever even touched you in a meaningful way? Because you can know all about him and not actually experience him or be obedient to him. We call that intellectualism. And we've also met people who are very into God. They, they're the first to raise their hands in worship. And they're, they're Shabbat Hyundai kicking and speaking in tongues, right? Like they're, they're very passionate and that's great. But here's the thing, you can be very passionate and even genuine, but without obedience and without the mind, it's just sensationalism. It's emotionalism. And what Paul is saying is, if you're gonna ever experience the full scope of God's love, you have to learn to integrate your life and to direct your life, it's, it's to love God. Jesus said it like this, didn't he? He said in Matthew 22, a lawyer came to him one day and said, Jesus, how do you, how do you just, you know, bring the whole thing into a sentence, would you? Like, we've got this whole book. Can you, can you dumb it down, Doc? Like, what, what is it? Oh, man, you know, you know you've been in a scripture when the page falls out. <laughs> That's good. Someone show me someone's Bible who's fallen apart. Their life's not. Amen. Uh, <laughs> But in, in, in Matthew 22, in Matthew 22, a lawyer came to Jesus, and what did he say? He said, Jesus, how do, you, how do you summarize all the law and the prophets? What's the great commandment? And Jesus said this, here's the great commandment. If you do this, everything else will click into place, didn't he? He said, love, didn't he? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your inner being, with all of your mind. You need to put your thoughts into it. Did you know that Jesus is brilliant? that there's wisdom in the word, that it's there to direct your thoughts. Love him with all your mind and with all your strength, yeah. And that when you learn to love God that way, to, to put your mind into it, to put your heart into it, to put your life into it, he says, then you will have life. And if you are not experiencing the fullness, if I am not experiencing the fullness of the, lo the life of God, it means I have not fully loved God in one of these areas. It's the love of God. It's the love of God, the love for God that actually brings the life of God. That's so significant. And so Paul is saying, my prayer for you is that you experience the full measure of God. And then he says this, and here's how it's going to come. That you would, you, would, uh, you, you, would, you would accept the love of God in your inmost being. That you'd be rooted and, and grounded and established in the love of God. And then what did he say? And here's the key. He said that you would grasp how Long and how, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of God. If you're taking notes, write this down. You, you have to first and foremost, if we're going to ever understand the love of God, we've got to understand ourselves and how love works. You need to know the parts of love. That there are, there's, mo there's different measures of love. That it's not just feeling, it's not just doing, it's not just thinking, it's all of these things unto God, and that as those things happen, the life of God flows in. It's the same way in your relationships. Haven't your relationships gotten better as you've learned? Like I'm thinking with my wife, with Melanie. I've learned to, to, to do what I said I'm going to do. What does that make her do? That draws her closer to me. I've learned to love her and to work on the passion. I've learned how to, to, to think like she thinks and to know her. That's how intimacy works, isn't it? And Paul is saying, my prayer for you is that you grow intimate with God through these things. Now, here's the challenge. The heart wants what the heart wants, doesn't it? It's one thing to say, okay, if I'm going to experience the great full measure of the life of God, if I'm going to experience it, i got to love him with every fiber of my being. i got to love him with all my mind and with all my heart and my, with all my strength, and then there, I'm going to be in this perfect relationship with God. Okay, got it. Let's go. But we know, don't we? You can't just make your heart love something, can you? It's like that, it's, it's that old Bonnie Raitt song. I can't make you love me. Right? You're welcome. Um, <laughs> you can't. 
The heart just, it's, it's a fickle thing. It does what it wants. And so, but here's the good news. Paul actually gives us the key. He gives us the secret into, stop texting me. He gives a secret into, uh, into how we actually can fall in love with God. And we can do this. Here, what did he say? Let's go back. Let's look at it. He says in verse 17, let's bring that back up. Verse 17, look what he says. Are you with me still? We good to do the deep dive into the Bible? He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, now say it, to grasp, so to conceive, to, to conceive in your mind, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep the love of who? Love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, and then you will be filled with the fullness of God. So what's he say? Here's the secret. He says the secret to loving God, I told you I'm an artist. He said the secret to loving God is seeing the love of God. This, so let me say it like this. The secret to the life of God is learning to love God, and the secret to loving God is seeing the love of God. You with me? Let me say, slow it down. The secret to experiencing the life of God is learning to love him. What is intimacy? It's trust, isn't it? It's proximity. It's integrating your life unto him. The secret to, love, to, to the life of God. If you're going to get the love of God, or the life of God, stay with me. I know this is a lot of L's. If you're going to receive the life of God, you have to learn to love God. But you can't just make yourself love God, can you? And so he gives us the key, though. He says the secret to loving God is seeing the love of God. And that when you see his love for you, it causes you to love him. That's the secret. Look at, well, look at what uh, John says. Uh, John says it in 1 John 4, 8. Let me read it like this. He's much more articulate than I am. John is the disciple that he, he wrote John's gospel and then a few letters, and he actually called himself the one that Jesus loved. He was the guy that was really tuned in to the love of God. And look what he says. He says, whoever does not love God, or whoever does not love does not know God. So what's he saying? He's saying that if you know God, you have love in you, right? Because, look, here it is. God is, say it, God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, here it is, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. What's atonement? It's, it's to cover, it's forgiveness, it's payment. An atoning sacrifice for our sin. Here it is again. God is, oh wow, the valley is not convinced. God is, thanks West, Halifax. Yeah, God is love. Do you notice it doesn't say God has love, does it? That's who he is. It's not what he has. God's not on a continuum. God is love. And he says, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. There's that picture of intimacy, isn't it? Seth actually got into it last week. I won't, I won't do this, but Seth mentioned how the, the, the language about knowing, like, and Adam knew his wife, like, it's actually, there's, like, that kind of sexual undertone. If, if you need someone to explain it, Pastor Adam's got that, and Seth, they'll, they'll handle that after service. Uh, but there's that, there's that knowing, there's that fullness, and the, the, the offspring of that relationship. Anyway, too much for today. Okay. But God in them. Here, look at this. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. What's he saying? The love of God can't, it can't the, the fear can't have room in your life where the love of God is. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, here, look what, here's the secret. Look what he says. He says, We love because what? He first loved us. So what's the secret? The secret to being able to love God with your mind, heart, and body, and then to receive the fullness thereof is to see the love of Jesus, to see the love of Christ, that that's the secret. He's saying, I pray that you would grasp, that you'd see, and then what's he do? He, he lays out the full scope of it, doesn't he? He's saying, expand the scope of your vision of the love of God. He's saying, it's much more than you think it is. And the reason that you don't love him perfectly is, not, is because you haven't seen how perfectly he loves you. 
And so he's saying it's, it's longer and it's wider than you think it is. And it's higher and it's deeper than you think it is. So if you're going to learn how to love God, you have to learn how to see his love for you. The measure of his love for you, the measure of his love for you is, is directly correlated to how much you're able to see. The measure, the measure of how much of his love you're able to receive is connected to how much of his love you're able to see. So he's saying, Paul is saying, see his great love for you. Knowing the love of God has for you is the key to receiving the life he has for you. Knowing his great love. So what's the secret of living a life in love with God? It's seeing the love he's giving you. And then Paul, what's he do? He says, he actually explains it, doesn't he? He says, the love of God is what? He says, the love of God is wide and long. Let's break it down. Because if this is the secret to living life in the fullness of God is seeing it, you and I have to learn how to see the love of God in a further scope every single day. So he says that God's love is, whoops, wide. He says God's love is long in Christ Jesus. So he's saying that Jesus, the love of God is demonstrated in Jesus. And he talks about how God's love is wide. What does he mean by God's love being wide and being long? Well, when he, when he refers to God's love being wide, the language in here is referring to like the span like, how far does it go? How far does the love of God go? He's referring to the span. He's referring uh, to the fact that it's, 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 it's space. And then he talks about long. How, how long is God's love? It's, it's referring to time, duration. And he's saying that the, the love of God is wider and longer than you think it is. Now, let's, can we geek out for a minute on theology? We got to? It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, so John wrote, God is love, right? We just read it. John, 1 John 4 says, God is love. That's who he is. And so if we're going to understand that, we got to dive a little deeper because love is a bit ambiguous, isn't it? So John actually gives us more clues. Another place, John tells us that God is spirit, what does it mean that God is spirit? Well, when we think of spirit, don't we think of spirit as this kind of like airy, fairy, mystical, ethereal sort of thing? Do we not? Like it's a spirit. It's woo. Yeah? Okay. Thanks, West. Yes. Yeah, we think of it like that. But that's actually not biblically what the Bible is trying to portray as spirit. When the Bible talks about spirit, it actually contrasts it with the carnal, with the flesh. And it basically holds up that the flesh is the thing that is actually, it's airy-fairy and, and up and down and decaying. How many of you have experienced this in life, that, that your love is fickle because your flesh is fickle? Like, how many of you have bad days? How many wives have said to their husband, I love you, but not today? <laughs> right? Yeah? I'm getting honest in church, right? Like, you, yeah, I don't feel love. Because we're humans, we're fickle, we're, we're, we're decaying, we're dying. Our love is not everlasting. It's up and down. It's bipolar, isn't it? We have bad days. We need mental health breaks. Like, that's what we need. And, and what the Bible's saying is God's love isn't like that. God, God doesn't wake up cranky. God does not need a mental health break. God doesn't look at you and say, you know what? I love you most days, but not today. He doesn't do that. God's love is spirit. What does that mean? It means it's unending. It means it's always turned on. And it never wavers. This is what First John or what James is talking about in James 1. James says that God's love, it doesn't cast shifting shadows. It means it never moves. I read, uh, I'll read a quote from a guy named J.I. Packer. Uh, he wrote a book called Knowing God. It's, it's fantastic. You should get it. It's awesome. But he, taught, he said in one, at one point, before I read the quote I want to read, he said at one point that you could never provoke God's love. You could never provoke God's love. What's he mean? He means that nothing you can do can actually change the measure of God's love. It's just always on. That's incredible. For, for those of you who think that you being good this week is going to make God love you more, let me remove the weight of religion off of your shoulders. No matter what you do, it doesn't change the dial on God's love. God is spirit. That means that God's love is always fully fixed on for you. 
You can't earn it. You can't make him love you more. He can't. He, he just, it's always on. And let me just tell the person who, who's here this week trying to get back to God and, and make God happy with them by being a good person. And you think that last week I had a bad week, so God's love isn't, isn't much, as much for me this week. It doesn't work that way. Your love cannot, you cannot provoke the love of God. You can't change it. It's just always forever on. You can't outrun it. You can't get away from it. He doesn't empty out. It doesn't, lo- it doesn't lose love. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't, it doesn't get weaker. It's just always on. All places, all times, that's all he is, all the time set on for you. Wow, good news. Now watch this. Look at this. I got to hurry. I'll take a golf clap there. I was preaching pretty hard for a golf clap, but that's all right. Uh, so... The love, the love God has, look at this, the love, the God, so the God who is love is first and foremost light. Or sorry, let's go to the next quote. It's got so much here. You should see my notes. They're a train wreck. So the love of God who is spirit is no fitful or fluctuating thing as human love is, nor is it mere important longing for things that may never be. Rather, it's a spontaneous determination of God's whole being in an attitude of benevolence and benefaction, an attitude freely chosen and firmly fixed. God's love never moves. It's always on. There are no inconsistencies or vicissitudes. What a word. I had to look that up too. Don't worry. Vicissitudes means like a, a sudden negative change. There's no vicissitudes in the love of the Almighty God who is spirit. His love is as strong as death, it says in the Song of Songs. Many waters can't quench the love of God. Rivers cannot wash it away. Nothing can separate from it those whom it has once embraced. That's how wide the love of God is. It never stops. So that means like regardless of the situation you're in, because don't we do that? We do the mental math like I'm going through this. Did I do something wrong? Is God trying to punish me? No. No. His love is always on. It's, it's it, regardless of circumstance. It's never off. It's firmly fixed. And then Paul goes on and he says this, the love of God is wide and it is long. It never stops. But then he breaks it down even more, doesn't he? And he says this, the love of God is also high. What does he mean by the fact that God's love is high? Now, when you and I think of love, a lot of the time we we think of it in terms of low. We think that the loving thing to do is to lower the bar, don't we? We think that it's loving when you, when you lower the bar for someone, and we'll get to that in a second, but the love of God is not a cheap thing. The love of God is a perfect thing. We talked in week two, didn't we, about the fact that God is what? He is holy. That means that God, when he loves, he does it perfectly. That means that what, he would never look on his creation or his sons and daughters and call something good that really isn't good. It means that he doesn't tolerate sin and decay and dysfunction. He hates it. That's, that's where we get this idea. So like God's love is holy. Uh, John doesn't just say that, the, that God is spirit, does he? He says also says that God is light. That his love is, if God is love, he is spirit and he is light. What does it mean that he is light? Let me read you this other, other Packer quote. This is awesome. So the God who is love is first and foremost light and sentimental ideas of his love as an indulgent, benevolent softness divorced from moral standards and concerns must therefore be ruled out from the start. God's love is a holy love. The God whom Jesus made known is not a God who is indifferent to moral distinctions, but a God who loves righteousness and hates iniquity, a God whose ideal for his children is that they should be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He will not take into into his company any person, however orthodox in mind, who will not follow after holiness of life. God's love is stern, for it expresses holiness in the lover and seeks holiness for the beloved. Scripture does not allow us to suppose that because God is love, we may look to him to cover happiness on people who will not seek holiness or to shield his loved ones from trouble when he knows that they need trouble to further their sanctification. See, his love is higher than ours. His love is better than ours. His love is not cheap. His love doesn't call sin okay. His love is just. It's true. It's perfect. This is where we get the idea of the wrath of God. What is wrath? Wrath is retribution. 
Wrath is justice. I know for a lot of us, we, we, we struggle with the idea of the wrath of God, but you think about, like you think that, that wrath and love are these kind of juxtapos- juxtaposed things. Like that, how can God be loving and wrathful? But actually, that's not, that's not true. Think about your life. Like if someone, if you're a parent and someone abused your child, like sexually abused your child and did something just horrible to them, don't you have wrath specifically because you love them? That's what wrath is. Wrath is that holy anger that says, I will not tolerate that. That's not okay. He's just. That's what wrath is. Tozer says in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, check it out. He said that the wrath of God, that God hates iniquity. God hates sin the same way that a parent hates the the disease that has taken the life of their child. Doesn't that, like, has anybody ever had a wrong done to them? Like, yeah, you, you, you know that, that, that wrath and that longing for justice and that longing for things to be made right. You know what that feels like, and it's actually because of love, not in spite of it. And so the Bible tells us that God's love is high and holy, and then that leaves us in a precarious position because if God's love is holy and God hates sin, what do we do with the fact that sin is in all of us, isn't it? If, if you don't think that, like, be honest with yourself for five minutes. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all, we all have. We know it. We have not lived up to this high, holy standard. And so here, Paul says, God's love is also deep. What does it mean that the love of God is deep? The Bible says that Jesus came and he offered himself as an atoning sacrifice, as an expression. He said, the Bible says that at just the right time, so we're talking about time, Christ died for the ungodly. At the fullness of time, it says, like that God set before the foundations of the earth that Christ would die for, for all people's sins. And the Bible says that this, once, this is a once and for all sacrifice. There's no one it can't reach. Listen, let me tell somebody today, you have not walked out of the bounds of God's love. You can't. It goes farther than you wander. Isn't that awesome? Like, let that hit you for a second. And the Bible tells us that, that the, the love of Christ is demonstrated on the cross. We see the wide and the long, and we see the high. We see the holy wrath of God poured out on the Son. The Bible says that it pleased the Father to afflict the Son. Because in that moment, when, when Jesus hung on the cross, he became sin. What does that mean? That means that when God, when God saw Jesus and he saw the punishment that he was taking, he no longer saw his son in that moment. He saw, he saw rape and racism and injustice and cancer and loss and death and disease and poverty and famine. He saw all the stuff that robs his kids and he poured out his wrath on it. He squashed it like a loving father. And simultaneously, Jesus, we read it earlier, becomes the atoning sacrifice for us. It's that deep love. He reached us at rock bottom. He offered us mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is to hold back the thing that you deserve. That's our cross. That's our wrath. Should be us hanging there. It should be our shame. It should be our condemnation. It should be our humiliation. And yet Jesus took our place. And then it's, it's beyond that. It's beyond just God holding back what we deserve. He went further. His love actually went deeper than just not making us stand to, the, to our own judgment. He didn't just spare us. Watch what he did. He offered us what? Grace. What's the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy is where God holds back what we do deserve. Grace is when he gives us what we don't. God did not just hold his wrath back from you and place it on his son, but the Bible says, like Paul just got done saying, he says, we have not just been forgiven, but we've been clothed in righteousness. We've been given an inheritance. We get all the rewards of the son of God. When Jesus was baptized and the the father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. We, when we come to the cross and we we put our faith in Jesus, we don't just receive mercy. We we receive that same statement. We have been made sons and daughters of God. and, And he looks upon us as he saw his perfect son and he sees us. He says, I'm pleased with him. I'm pleased with her. That's grace. 
to be given what we don't deserve. See how deep is the love of God. I remember I told that story at Christmas for those of you who were there, trying to get an understanding on just how great the love of God is. Uh, I told a story about a missionary I heard um, who had gone to this people group and he was bringing the gospel to them and it came about Christmas time and he decided I'm going to give some Christmas gifts, show them the kind of this American tradition and, and he gave them the gifts and uh, he's saying this, uh, you know, this represents how God gave us the gift of his son and, and, and blah, blah, blah. And so he gave the gifts out. And then a couple days later, this, this, this guy from this local came up to him and gave him a seashell and, and said, this is a gift. Merry Christmas. And, as he, you know, the missionary was kind of touched. He's like, oh, cool. Thanks. Oh, that's nice. You, you got my tradition. Great. And he went on about his business and that was that. And then a couple days later after that, uh, he, a person saw the seashell and he said, whoa, where'd you get that? And, and the guy said, oh, so-and-so gave it to me. He's like, do you know how hard those are to find? You have to walk like two days to get that. And you got to go over like coral reefs and volcanic rock. Like you don't just get those seashells. Those are priceless. And so the missionary went back to the guy and said, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't understand how, how valuable this was. And, and the guy said to the missionary, he said, that's okay. For us, the long walk is part of the gift. It's what makes it valuable. What makes the cross so incredible is that Jesus left that high holy place. It says in Philippians 2 that he did not consider equality with God as something to grasp, but he instead gave up his divine privileges. Like he gave up his glory in heaven forever and ever. He gave up his power. He gave up his rights. He gave up his perfection and he left it there and he came down and he took on this frail, mortal human body. I heard one theologian say, you know, for the closest you can wrap your head around almighty God becoming human is if you became a slug to redeem the slugs. And yet it's infinitely more than that. Like, just see how deep the love of God is for you. See the long walk. He became a human and he lived in obscurity. He was a refugee with a humble carpenter for for an upbringing. He lived, he he walked for 30 years in complete obscurity. And then three years he, he taught and he ministered. He was misunderstood and people said they loved him. And then they walked away from him. And then he walked to Jerusalem and he walked down the, the, the Via Della Rosa carrying his own cross. He stood before Pilate and he listened to the arrogance of humanity say, do you know the power I have over you? And he humbled himself over and over, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, deeper, all the way to a Roman cross where he didn't just experience the excruciating physical pain, but he felt the spiritual wrath of God poured out on him. God, who only knew the goodness and community and love of God, he felt complete and utter isolation. That's the most brutal part of the cross. And he went all the way to death. Like, see the deep, deep love of God in Christ Jesus. See how deep. See how perfect it is. See how wide and how long it is. See the love of God. See his mercy. See his grace. And as you see it, can't you feel it even right now, flooding it into your heart? As you just stop and you pump the brakes and you just think about like, how far he came from me. How wide and how perfect is this love? As you start to think about it, what happens? It draws us closer to him, doesn't it? It causes us to trust him. It causes us to lay things down. And then all of a sudden, the spirit starts flooding into our hearts and flooding into our minds and flooding into our lives. This is how it works. This is how it works. When you see the love of God, it causes you to trust him and to step toward him. And as you do that, the fullness starts filling you up. It's not through mental gymnastics. It's not through hyper obedience. It's not through who can be the most wild in worship. It's simple that the life of God comes because you learn to love God. You learn to love him with your mind, your strength, and your heart. But the way that you learn to love God is seeing the great and radical love he had for you. And as you see it, the life of God flows into you. Like, let me break this down in real time for us and I'll be done. Like, how does this work, practically speaking? When you look at the cross, if you're taking notes, third, third, the third thing is this. You need to know the power, the product of, of true love. 
Knowing the love of God is the key to receiving the life of God. So how does this actually flesh itself out? And I just wanted to give you this equipment because you need to learn how to see the cross of Christ every single day in every single way in every single circumstance because that's what allows the power and the life of God to flow into you. Think about it with your mind. Like how many of us struggle with fear? No one. Oh, wow. Look at these, war- look at these warriors here in <laughs> Valley Campus. No, like, like how often do you just get plagued with, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know if it's all going to be okay. I don't know what's going to happen next. Don't anybody else other than me, like if you let your mind go, it's just like life is scary. And if you tell somebody else anything other, you're lying. Life is a scary, brutal place. Bad things do happen to good people. And here's the other part. You're not a good person anyway, so bad things happen to bad people. So what do you do with your fear? What do you do the morning you wake up and you hear the diagnosis? Do you freak out or do you look at how high and how deep and how wide is the love of Christ? And you remind remind yourself, the moment you you consider the cross, all of a sudden, courage starts flooding in. And you remind yourself, okay, if God is for me, who can be against me? Uh, He says, the word word says that, that God causes all things to come together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. The word tells me that even if I face death, I'm gonna rise again, that the same way Christ rise, the same power that rose Christ from the dead now dwells in me. You start preaching the gospel to yourself and courage starts flooding your mind. Confidence flows from the cross. Clarity What do we do with the confusion? We live in confusing times, don't we? This is true and this is true. It's all true. No, it's not. This is true. It's truth. Peace. The fullness of God starts flooding our minds. What about about our hearts? What about when, like how many of us just long for validation? The things, those, those capacities in us. Like, how many of us just long for validation? That, that, y'all, that's what that thing you do when you post a picture on Facebook and then you go back on hoping that somebody clicked like? No, it's not funny. You are starving for validation. You want so bad. And, and here's the thing. I, you get 100 likes. It doesn't really matter. you got to go post another picture to get more likes. I need validation. Here's the thing. If you learn to look at the cross instead of look at Facebook and Instagram to get that heart click, and you look at the cross and you see the heart click that's been favored in your direction, and you see the like of God, the almighty God who made you and formed you in your mother's womb, who made you with a plan and a purpose, he says, well done. Your validation, joy, freedom, acceptance. Some of us just want so bad to fit in. Some of us want a family so bad. We want a place to belong. We want to be known. I want somebody to just know me. Look at the cross. What about, what about your life? One more. Let's, let's break this down. When you see, here's probably the biggest misconception I grew up with, and depending on your tradition, if you grew up in church, I grew up with this idea that the measure of my love for God is connected to how good I can be. And that if I'm a good person, I really love God. Super backwards. That if you start to learn how to love God, it makes you a good person. That's how it works. So when you love God, what happens? When you, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, all of a sudden you, you, you get to be like him. You, it becomes easier to be obedient. It's not this difficult thing. It's not, it's not moral you know, behavior modification. You, your character starts changing. How? It says in 2 Corinthians 3, it says, here's how you change. Not by saying, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to go to a Tony Robbins course. I'm going to get all inspired, and I'm going to be a better person. That's not how it works. And how many have failed enough times to know? I can't talk myself into transformation. It doesn't work. 
Here's how you are changed. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 3, as we contemplate his glory, as we consider his glory, as we fix our eyes on the greatness of Jesus with unveiled faces, 2 Corinthians 3, with unveiled faces as we contemplate the Lord's glory, what happens? We are transformed from glory to glory to glory to glory. If you want to kick the habit, it's more than just saying, I'm going to quit this. It's actually saying, I need, I obviously, uh, there's something I'm missing. I'm deficient in some area, and I need to see Jesus more. That's how it works. I wish I had more time to break that down for some of you, but here's the secret to life. See Jesus. That is the secret of life. Hebrews 12.1 says, let us throw off every hindrance and every sin and all the things that, that slow us down and tear us apart. And he says what? He says, and we do this by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Every morning, I remember having a conversation with Dan and Anthony one morning and we were, they're, they're guys that I just do life with. Every Monday we, we pray together and we share and we dream and we confess and all that stuff. And if you don't have anybody in your life that you can do that with, find them because you need it. And one of those mornings we were all just kind of confessing some, some funk in our lives. And I think it was Dan that said, you know, I just feel the Lord saying to us that we need to stop focusing on ourselves and focusing on our inadequacy and look to his sufficiency. And just let's just make it about him this morning. And I said something after that, and we, we've kind of stuck with this or since in the months since then. And I said, you know, we need to learn how to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. And that maybe personal evangelism isn't so much about telling others about Jesus, although that's important. Maybe personal evangelism is more about telling myself about Jesus. In the oncology ward, I need to preach the gospel to myself. When my child is running wild, I need to preach the gospel to myself. When I failed again, I need to preach the gospel to myself and remind myself there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus over and over. For every deficiency, he is sufficient. For every deficiency, he is sufficient. For every deficiency, he is sufficient. And so you need to see the love of Christ. And as you see the love of Christ, it causes you to love him. And as you love him, you move closer and he moves closer. And you begin to become more filled with the full measure of who he is. Let me pray for you. Stand with us, all of our locations. Let's stand. Father, thank you today. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that you have perfectly loved us. And Lord, I pray today, even as you have bore witness to your love for us, God, I pray that we would leave here not just inspired or with some kind of momentary heart flutter where we, we feel the Spirit moving. We thank you for that, God. But I pray that we would leave here equipped to become evangelists to ourselves. And we'd every single morning get up and remind ourselves how wide your love is that today I have not found myself in a place where your love will not reach. And we'd say, your love is long. That means today the time hasn't run out on your love, that it's still right here, right now. It's a right here, right now kind of love. And then we'd look up and we'd say, your love is high, that it's perfect, that it's holy, that you love me better than to allow me to settle for scraps and that I would see how deep your love is, that you would go all the way to death and that if you would die for me, how could I not trust you? And so Lord, teach us to love you and that in that we would be filled to the fullness of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the message today. If you wanna stay up to date, go ahead and click subscribe to follow us on YouTube. And hey, if you want to partner with us in getting these messages farther, you can go to our website and find out ways that you can give and help us get the good news of Jesus further than ever before.